Welcome to another iteration of our participatory governance seminar series organized by the participatory governance cluster of Participedia. My name is Paul Inoinovich. I am the managing director of Participedia. And Participedia, for those that don't know, is the world's largest database and community actively studying democratic innovations. We have a very exciting iteration of today's talk featuring Andre Bechtiger, as well as Seraphine Arnold, uh, who will be presenting on roads to many public success, exploring top-down and bottom-up roads to uptake based on new data set of deliberative mini publics in Europe. And they'll be drawing on Participedia case studies as a starting point. Uh, and the discussion will outline what conditions have led to successful uptake of mini public recommendations, and of course, where the nuances and complexities come into play. Uh, before I ha hand it over to Julian, uh, to talk a little bit more about the speakers and then we get started more formally, I would like to take a moment uh, to offer some reflection. This is what we do in terms of our Participedia community. We reflect uh, as a community on the land that we are residing. And although a digital database and global community, Participedia Phase 2 is grounded, oh, sorry about that, is grounded at McMaster University, which is in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, what is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Mississauga nations. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement, you see on to your right. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement describes the dish to represent the territory and one spoon to symbolize the peoples living on and sharing the resources of the land, only taking what we need and keeping the dish clean. We recognize the ongoing effects of colonial processes of erasure, marginalization, and extraction, of which we are intimately a part of. And we encourage all Participedia members and those joining us today to reflect solidaristically on the indigenous sovereignties, colonial legacies, and life relations on the land in which you are residing or find yourself on as you join us. And to find ways, of course, to support those indigenous communities and to support better life relations. Uh, thank you for taking the time again joining us today and listening to these offerings and sharings from Seraphine and Andre. I will now pass it over uh, to Julian. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm really happy to see uh, this nice crowd with people from all over the world. I want to apologize if my voice sounds like uh, a duck, as we would say in French, but I've been feeling under the weather and my nose is completely uh, blocked and stuffy. But even if I'm a bit uh, sick, I wouldn't have uh, missed this presentation for anything in the world because this is a great topic introduced by two uh, great researchers, André Bachtiger from the University of Stuttgart and also uh, Seraphine Arnold, PhD student working uh, with André on the topic of the impact of deliberative mini publics. So as you all know, we have spent a lot of attention on what happens inside the deliberative mini publics, but uh, recently we have also looked at what happens beyond. And the research that we will um, learn about today is the uh, state of the art research about the impact of mini publics, because they not only look at what happens after, but also the conditions under which many publics have an impact. So I'm really pleased to give the floor to André and Seraphine. They will present their research during 25 minutes, and then we will have 35 minutes for questions and answers. Thank you very much. And André, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot for this nice introduction. I also have to say something actually that would be Seraphine's moment, <laughs> but unfortunately she's ill as well. And we have agreed that I'm just the spokesperson and about 80% or 90% of what I'm going to just read out loud is really Seraphine's work, just to make that clear. So I'm just the spokesperson. So this is all collaborative work. It's Seraphine is the main researcher here, but it's also collaborative work with Mark Warren in the context of a project sponsored by the European Commission called UCOMMIT in the Horizon 2020 framework. And this is what we're going to present today. I just need to, one little thing I need to, so stop. 
Okay. I, would, I just want to make a little introduction, and Julien has also mentioned that, why are we really interested in these consequentiality issues? Because at all the times, the focus was a bit different. I will also take a sneak view on perceived legitimacy of many publics, because that actually plays together with consequentiality. And then we present all the new data set, the results Seraphine got, and we then do a little discussion and hopefully a little provocative conclusion. Research on many publics, and uh, Julien has worked on this quite a lot, really shifted its focus from micro to macro dynamics. Julien also calls the different generations of mini public research. And the first generation was just on micro dynamics. And it had a very good reasons. People like Jim Fishkin in the early 2000s were confronted with a lot of criticism from standard political participation researchers telling people like Jim, it cannot work. What all we know is participation is biased. Now you put these people into a deliberative forum, it will be a tragedy, it won't work. Now, 50 years of research have really shown this is all not true. If you have supportive conditions, ordinary citizens can deliberate. Nonetheless, and I think that's also kind of interesting and nuanced, if you take a more in-depth look what's happening in this mini public proceed things you also see well they can deliberate but it's still not everyone can do it with equal ability and this also has direct consequences for voice and opinion formation and Vanessa Schweiger who's also part here from the University of Stuttgart has also worked on this really showing this is in a way sometimes also a bit nuanced what you also know is participants do learn and change minds in many publics quite a bit. But again, this happens in much, much more complex ways than previously assumed. In a just an article that just appeared with Francisca Meyer in the European Journal of Political Research, we find something what we would call reason-based backlash of progressive ideas. What does that mean? So Francisca looked at political rights for foreigners in a small and short deliberative treatment and the effect was after a short deliberation people actually moved away from political rights for foreigners now you can say maybe they just in a way didn't think about that no what we can show is those who were in the deliberative treatment they really had more reasons than those who weren't and they also had substantive reasons why doing so all I want to say here is there's still a lot to do at the micro level because there are still some very interesting and intriguing results. Nonetheless, what we have seen in the past 10 years is a stronger focus on microdynamics. And now I'm going to enter, first of all, a bit into perceived legitimacy. Because, and this is something that sometimes many public advocates I'm not fully aware. I don't want to criticize them, but I think this is a basic challenge of lotocracy, and Christina Lafont has really brought that up into the limelight, namely that the problem is, well, you're randomly chosen, you're chosen by the lot, meaning that only very few people can actually participate. Now, what we do know is those who have participated are normally quite big mini-public fans afterwards, but what about all those who haven't participated in many publics. And at the end of the day, if you would want to have more autocracy in our democracies, you would have to deal with the fact that there are many, many citizens who will not have participated. So they need sort of trust and perceived legitimacy towards these many publics. This is now all research that Saskia Goldberg has done in the past years. And the findings are, I think, also nuanced and intriguing. What Saskia found is that in one way, non-participants, they like many publics. There is attitudinal sympathy for many publics. But then if you look at specific design things, they get very, very conservative. So they don't want many publics, for instance, to be empowered to make binding decisions. They also want to couple them with representative institutions. And they ask for something like extra provisions, for instance, large size of a mini public and clear majorities for recommendations, like saying 
you need a very strong signal in order to really say this is something to be considered in serious ways. Now, Saskia, we first ran this whole thing in Germany, and you can say maybe these are just results related to Germany. But what we found in further studies is that can all be replicated in the United States, in Ireland, where the most consequential mini publics have happened, and in a high trust society like Finland. And what you see here on the right hand side, you will find exactly the same thing in the United States, in Ireland and Finland. And that's really surprising. I will say a bit at the end what that means for the study of mini publics. Nonetheless, and now we're on consequentiality, even if citizens do not want empowered many publics, if they have taken place, and this is what Lisa van Dijk and Jonas Lefebvre showed in a very nice piece, they still want that these recommendations are somewhat how taken up by areas. So consequentiality matters. Now, for a long time, I think, and I was also one of those, like, copy-pasting that, saying, well, they're normally not very successful. So many public recommendations are just not taken up. But then came the OECD report. I will come back to that in a minute. Finding very high acceptance rates, 89% of many public recommendations. And I think that's really, really interesting. The whole issue of mini public consequentiality is also connected with an important normative debate. And the question is, how does mini public uptake impact happen? Is it top down or is it a result of a bottom up pathway? Now, something that we clarified in nice internal deliberations with Mark Warren, we have to be very careful if we just say top down or bottom up. Top down and bottom up doesn't mean more or less democratic. For instance, you could say you have a mini public organized top down and then elites are finally listening to what citizens want and become more responsive. That's also democratic and adding to democratics, to democracy's vitality and viability. But of course, if it's just organized top down, if it's all only if uptake only happens if it's in full alignment with the preferences of elites. And for instance, it's also just for policy appraisal, then it's really a sort of a window dressing exercise and when we can really question what are mini publics for. So this is the basic questions we wanted to look at. And of course, we are not the first ones to do that. There has been much more research on that topic, but we want to just highlight two important studies. One has the, been done by Juan Font, who's also part of UCOMED in a very lovely piece. And they found in the Spanish context that many public recommendations are cherry picked by public authorities, meaning they had to align with elite preferences. Otherwise, elites just discarded those. Excellent and important findings, but limited to the Spanish context. The OECD in 2022, 2020, just provided a much broader database on deliberative mini publics in OECD countries. And it's a very big data set. Nonetheless, we still thought, how systematic is it really? And what was particularly missing are the antecedents to really study why you have such high rates and how that works and when it fails and so on. So we thought it's still time to do something more. And this is where Seraphine entered the scene and started in the context of UCOMIT to really create a new data set based on Participedia. But because we couldn't get all information, I will come back to that in a minute, we also provided or, or also, we also performed an observer survey. So what's, what is in the data set? There are a lot of deliberative events, something like 150 totally, it's only those which use stratified random sampling at the regional and national level in Great Britain, Germany, France, Ireland, Italy, Denmark, Finland, as well as the European level. We, we are happy to say more on the country selection if you're interested, but maybe something is really important to stress. You might wonder why just at the regional, national and pan-European level and not at the local level. 
Of course, you can say a lot of action is happening at the local level, but to have a proper sample at the local level, this is almost impossible to do. There has been a PhD researcher in Baden-Württemberg, Uwe Rehmer, who really tried to map all deliberative events at the local level in Baden-Württemberg. And he completely got lost because at the end of the day, he had to do web scraping from local newspapers in order to document all these cases. Because if you ask the administrations, they just didn't know. So we thought focusing on the regional and national level, and we are pretty sure that we have really captured the most important cases in these different countries. I will also come back to that in a minute. We then define mini public uptake as full, partial, or no implementation of mini public recommendations. And we're also happy to say more on this when you're interested. Now on to Seraphine to say something a bit about this observer survey. Right. Um, first of all, the observer survey that you can see here um, is it was uh, conducted as an online survey. And um, we started out because we had a lot of information about um, the different cases already found on Participedia, which uh, was great to do that. But for some variables, like for example, changes in public policy, this would be more difficult. And we started out uh, with this list uh, based on Participedia, showing this tool, for example, country observers or observers that were we considered experts in a specific area and showed them the list where we considered them an expert in and then they could rate like how well they knew the case so that was so that we in the next step could only sh show them an app, those cases they knew something about and um, to code our variables of interest and if we can go to the next slide perfect um for every rating they gave us like for every coding for example for if there was policy change or not. Um, we also always asked um, their confidence to get a better overview. We also had, uh, they also had the ability to give reasons for their ratings in another text field. And um, in the end for this uh, analysis we did, we decided that we would, if there was some conflicts between the different researchers or observers, um, that we would go with the rating that was a bit more conservative, a bit more critical. And um, yeah, also we asked them to um, uh, add cases if to the to the list as a whole, uh, if they thought there were some cases that we missed that probably weren't on Participedia. And yeah, Andre will tell you now uh, which antecedents we included in the database. Yes, and we have looked at four types of antecedents and one control. We looked at political support, alignment, and non-alignment of recommendations with the preferences of political elites. Serafine has just talked about that. Then we also looked at several variables of process design, for instance, whether it was top-down or bottom-up, even though we also found it was never fully top-down or fully bottom-up. It was, in a way, rather top-down and rather bottom-up. We also looked at things like authorization. Was it just made for informed opinion, for recommendations or binding decisions? If I remember correctly, Seraphine, but correct me, there was no binding decision. But the interesting case, I think, was the informed opinion, because you could say, well, how can informed opinion Many public students just informed opinion have impact. Well, there were cases where they had impact, so they're not just trivial. We also looked at purpose. Is it just policy appraisal or can these participating citizens also develop, develop policies? We looked at format, face-to-face, -face, online. We looked at size, large and small. And a particularly interesting variable here is whether these many publics have been directly coupled with the representative system, meaning that there were representatives or people from the administration directly built into the mini public. You also see a kind of an overlap, what I have been talking before. Seraphine took up these ideas that Saskia developed, saying some things like coupling or size are very important for perceived legitimacy. And the question here is, are they also important for consequentiality? We also looked at different issue types at different levels. 
And we also had to use a timing variable because, as you have seen, we looked at cases from 2000 to 2020. And it's very clear if a case happened in 2010, the probability that there is uptake is just higher than for a case which only happened in 2019. So we had to check, Seraphine had to check for the exact timing. Now, in order to come back to the big question, what we're trying to look back, or Seraphine has been trying to look at, is there a sort of a top-down pathway or a more bottom-up pathway? And what you see in a top-down pathway, that would mean it's just organized from top-down, it's for policy appraisal only, and it's in full alignment with the preferences of political elites. And the more bottom-up pathways, there is no full alignment with elite preferences, there is policy development, and it is rather bottom-up organization. A quick look at the dependent variable changes in public policy. So there was a three tiered dependent variable, no implementation, partly implemented or fully implemented, which we had to drop, Seraphine had to drop it to two because fully implemented was very scarce. I have two examples maybe to illustrate why that is the case. For instance, there has been a very successful case also portrayed widely in Baden-Württemberg. This was about a pension reform for MPs. And the idea was originally in the federal, in, sorry, in the regional parliament that MPs should get a very luxurious pension. And then the Greens thought Ooh, that could not maybe be so well received by their own constituents and put it to a citizen forum. And the citizen forum very clearly said they should have a decent pension, but not a luxurious one. However, there was policy development in that mini public, and these citizens really made very creative proposals how these MPs could get a better pension. And then experts said, well, this is all great. But at the end of the day, that would require a constitutional change at the national level. So end of the day, the case had to be coded as partly implemented because it was policy development, which could not be so easily put into practice. Now, what you see here is when you look at the acceptance rate, OECD 89, we are down to 41 acceptance rate. And some of you might still say this is still very high at the end of the day. Nonetheless, nonetheless, we think it's high, but there might be also cases, and this is maybe a good point for discussion. I have another case which shows a bit what acceptance means. There was a case in the Bundesland Hessen in Germany, and this case was about, in a way, reform in bureaucracy. And the citizen panel unanimously came to the conclusion <laughs> there should be more transparency. Full stop. Who in the world can be against more transparency in the administration? Everyone agreed that was also put into a sort of a more formal document. Perfect. Of course, you can say if they would have made clear obligations what transparency really means, it might have been politicized. Like as a similar case, like climate assemblies, if you say citizens agree that something has to be done about the climate, everyone agrees. But if you say there should be speed limits on motorways, then it gets politicized and then there's no more full agreement. So cases like these are also part of this relatively high rate. Now on to the results. Back to you, Seraphine. You maybe just tell me when <laughs> I put on. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Um, so the main substantive uh, result or finding really is that political support has this positive effect on changes of public policy. So that's already very interesting. Then the organization, um, which means is a top-down or bottom-up initiated, has uh, a negative effect. This is only marginally significant, but that it is negative means that if it's bottom-up initiated, it is less likely that there's any policy changes um, occurring. And for Purpose, which means was the purpose a policy appraisal or was the purpose policy development? Um, there we find no effect, which we find surprising because um, we would have imagined it could be that uh, if there's policy development, this could lead to way more challenging uh, 
um, proposals uh, by the citizens. And yeah, so, but we find no effect there. And for authorization, which means, is it an informed opinion? Is it a recommendation? Is it a recommendation plus referendum? Or is it a binding de a decision? There we have a big effect. And this is uh, also makes sense because it's um, necessarily so and might seem trivial, but the variable is also a bit more complex in the sense that there were also some cases uh, where informed opinion uh, led to changes in public policies. And the process design, like size, format, and composition, seemingly does not matter. And the level matters. Regional cases are more successful in the sense of policy changes than national or European ones. And time matters. Yeah, there's less implementation success for recent cases. And the issue type, like if uh, the salience or the technicality of the issue, they seemingly don't matter. That's it for the. Oh, and yeah. I should also add, I didn't say for this uh, multi level logistic regression model, we only had uh, 62 of the cases which we, with which we could calculate to, uh, which also explains uh, when something is, for example, not as easily significant. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I would also add, Seraphine will also do an imputation with missing variables in a way in order to have the whole 150 cases for analysis. Mm -hmm. And the suspicion is, or we expect that you just get more clear results, for instance, for this organization, top-down organization. So it's still based on a limited number of cases, but it's still amazing that these things actually show up and... Um, Leading me to the sort of wrap up what we found, if we summarize, we could say it's a rather top down road to mini public success, as Seraphine nicely put it. If there must be support, it must be sort of init initiated top down, then the chances are much higher that recommendations are implemented at the end of the day. If it's more rather bottom up and does not align with the preferences of political elites, then policy uptake does barely happen. Nonetheless, it's still a nuanced message, because at the end of the day, we also can say it's not fully top down. Sonia Busso and Danica Flois have argued in that direction. Maybe it's a more mixed scenario that we're finding, and that's exactly what we do. One very interesting result is that implementation is not dependent whether it's limited just to appraisal or whether citizens can redevelop policies. And the case I was telling about, this pension reform is exactly one of those. So it was organized top down, but the citizens had the possibility to come up with very creative proposals. And it doesn't matter for any sort of success afterwards. Also very interesting is it doesn't matter whether political authorities are involved or not. And this is also one thing because it's a hotly debated issue. It has been hotly debated already in the Irish context in this citizen forum on same-sex marriage. There were 66 randomly selected citizens and 33, if I remember correctly, politicians from parliament. And that was seen as a very good way that you could really make interactions between the two spheres, the representatives and the citizens, so that uptake is given. But we find it just doesn't matter. And there are also interesting lessons for many public organizers. If you care about consequentiality, the design components, size, for instance, doesn't matter at all. But remember what I said before, when it comes to perceived legitimacy, design design definitely does matter. Size and so on is very important for spectators. But again, when it comes to consequentiality, it doesn't really matter. Let us conclude with a provocative st uh, statement. I think the standard mini public story, which is very often also portrayed now in many magazines, is the story that ordinary citizens can deliberate together, at least in, in, in good ways. They learn and change their minds. Many publics, as the OECD report found, are fairly consequential for policy, for, for practice. And we could say, if you take that all together and all the positive experiences of participants, 
the idea is why don't we give them more power and move more to a lotocratic vision of democracy. Based on all we presented, we would still suggest a more semi-revisionist mini-public stories. Well, ordinary citizens can deliberate, but there are still problems. Not everyone can do it with equal ability. The OECD report may have also a bit exaggerated the formal account of mini-public success. We found it's lower, but the rate is still quite high. But again, as a side note, as I said, with this case in Hessen on administrative reform, sometimes it's also a tiny bit trivial what sort of success that is. Then we also found, Seraphine found, that successful events are rather top-down and require especially the alignment with political preferences. And what Saskia Goldberg found, well, the non-participating citizens, they like many publics, but they don't want to have more empowerment. And in a way, we can say the hopes for a swift replacement of legacy institutions such as parliament by many publics, that may be just a very long shot. In the new book that John Dreisek and myself wrote, we make a claim that we need to start a new thinking about many publics. The book is called Deliberative Democracy for, Diabol for Diabolical Times. And our point is many publics can play a role, but we have to consider the overall discursive infrastructure of societies, including the public sphere, but also including empowered communication, uh, communication in the empowered sphere, Many publics can play a role, but they are not the only tool to save democracy. They are just maybe a tiny drop in the architecture of future democracies. They can play a role, but they won't save democracy on their own. Many thanks, and now we are very interested in the discussion. Thank you so much, André and Seraphine, for the great presentation, for uh, respecting the timing as well. And I, I have to admit that I think it's the first time I've listened to your presentation, but you succeed every time in keeping it interesting. So congratulations uh, to that. So without further ado, we will now have the Q&A. Um, so basically, there are two options for you to participate. You can either raise your hand with the Zoom software, or you can use the chat to write down your question. I don't know if we have any candidate to break the ice and ask the first question. We have one question from Michael Hoffman. Please, you can go ahead. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, yes. perfect. Yeah, thank you. So th that was really exciting. Um, I, I have a, I, my name is Michael Hoffman. I'm a philosopher at Georgia Tech. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, you know, uh, what I found interesting is the, that the support from political actors is uh, significant. Now, I'm wondering about the following. You know, that, uh, what, you know there can be two different reasons. Uh, on the one hand, it could be a question of ideology or just power so that politicians want to keep power, you know, or it's ideology. But it could also be a question of expertise. Um, you know, policymakers um, have access to expertise which um, uh, many publics might not have to that degree. So it might be that simply a question of, um, you know, adequacy. So you have a policy problem and the mini public doesn't get to the uh, to the expertise that is needed to decide it. So that would be my first question. The second question is, um, I, I mean, it's challenging that your results differ so much from the OECD results. So I think that asks for an explanation. And the third question is, um, so, you know, I mean, uh, you, you measure impact at a certain point in time. The question would be, what could, could there be impact that has a long term uh, it, or it turns out to be only in the long term, but not immediately? For example, you could say, OK, there's no direct uh, uptake in policymaking, but it could shift the public discussion in a way that the uptake happens two or three or five or 10 years later. So the question is whether this empirical study should be um, enlarged by some <laughs> long-term data collection. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. André, you can already start answering Michael's question since yeah. we 
the time to collect the questions out yeah. of work. Yeah. I also asked Seraphine if so, shall I start at, uh, answering and you just jump yeah. in when you Yeah, I have a few ideas about the uh, difference to the OECD data set. Yeah, okay. Then I start with the first one and turn over to you. Yes, this is an excellent question. Why that sort of support? And again, we are here, we really have data limitations. And in one way, we would really love to know more what is the exact case. In one way, you could say, of course, we can look into that by just focusing on specific cases and reconstruct them. Like I think several of the climate citizen assemblies have, there has been that sort of work, for instance, what Macron thought and what the sort of motivations are sometimes it might be also mixed right that you say it's ideology it's power it's coming together but this is the bit the problem with these kind of large data banks particularly when you go back into time it was difficult also with these external observers i mean they gave information but sometimes they also couldn't tell so much more what we would have been interested in. but i think it's also maybe a sort of a call for future research and also participedia to say, why don't we ask those now working on the ground and say, collect these things and have more specific questions, and then we can have a richer data set. Seraphine. I think you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that took shortly. Um, yeah, thank you for the wonderful questions. Um, the, you really have a point that it looks a bit uh, striking or one wonders why what could be the reasons for these differences we find for the OECD database and there are various reasons. Um, for example, one would be that uh, OECD uh, has way more countries to look at because they looked at all OECD member countries. We looked at some European countries. Also, they included um, countries that are uh, that uh, they included cases that are only also on the local level, which we didn't and which we would expect maybe uh, more easily have an, um, an uptake. And also they had like way more years they went back to than we did. Um, and also in the end, they still had like the number of cases where they um, in total had a value on if there was uptake or not. Um, was comparably small for how many cases they had, had. It was like, I think, 88 or something. And we had 80 with a way smaller sample. So my idea was maybe that through these many missings that those cases that were the most um, prominent and successful ones maybe were the most easy to find data on. And it was just very scarce to find data for them um, for us as well in the beginning, that's why we did the observer survey. I think that this could be a bias issue, that um, it's more easy to find answers to this for cases that were really successful and maybe that therefore also studied and yeah, where you could easily access them. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And just a little update on this. I mean, I agree with Thorsten there. I mean, we are not, this is not a representative sample. It's also not a kind of, let's say, that's our all cases in that period. But I think we got at least in many cases, I think we are pretty sure at also at the regional level that we have really caught the major cases. Of course, there might have been others, but the observers also in all the various countries didn't really get us other cases. Of course, as we said, I mean, there needs to be still done some imputation because for some cases we lack certain information because also observers didn't know that. And the, your last point is an excellent point. We tried to address it a bit with this timing variable saying we, we, we take into account when the case was launched. So again, saying those in 2005 have a higher chance that implementation happened. Yes, and that would be also the case. Nonetheless, I still think, I mean, we didn't, let's say if we had just very recent cases, then you can of course say it might take some time. Nonetheless, if it's 10 years have passed and nothing has happened, I think political elites have also forgotten about these things or have already run another mini public. Thank you, André. Um, so now I have a question from Rosa uh, Zubizarreta uh, and then from Torsten, but Rosa, please. 
Oh, um, I, I wanted to say thank you for such a clear and engaging presentation. And I, I don't have specific questions on the research itself, but I am very interested in the supportive conditions of many publics and how we might extend those to this, um, what you will be writing about in your forthcoming mm -hmm. book about mm -hmm. the discursive infrastructure of society. Uh, my research has been on the group facilitation of the many publics, because I do think that uh, there might be a lot of resource uh, for that larger project there. Thank you. That's an excellent point. And I think that's also something that needs to be explored in concrete empirical research. What we have been looking first at all is in, in, in this idea that, for instance, we also need to connect those who participate in many publics with their interpersonal networks. There have been study by Michael Neblo and his co-authors showing scaling up can also mean that those who have participated tell them to others. And that can have a very interesting effect. So if you talk about the discursive infrastructure, it is not only mini publics, it's also interpersonal networks that really do matter. And very often you hear a lot about these things and that needs to be incorporated into research. Then what we, on the supportive conditions, I think it might also be who are you targeting? And uh, we make this argument that there are groups like, for instance, let's say people who are effectively polarized and there have been wonderful experiments. Jim Fishkin has run one, but he was not the only one bringing together effectively polarized Democrats and Republicans into one room and letting them deliberate. And they all depolarized. Mike Neblo, he told me that recently has even more spectacular results with his deliberative town hall meetings, because the old idea was always then don't talk about politics, talk about, let's say, you, your food preferences or whatever, or what you do or how the weather is. But he could show even if they talk about politics, these sort of depolarization effects do happen. So to make a long story short is for specific groups that might exactly be what's necessary. And that these things all also need to be publicized to say, look, they came together and in a way they came in a way they see the world differently. Of course, you can say the extreme partisans will never probably take part in those, but many Trump supporters and many effectively polarized people, they still have other ideas. And if they meet others, it's going to be a different world. So maybe many publics can really target exactly those people, but for many other people in the middle, that yeah. might not be so important. So in a way, discursive infrastructure really means that you look at all ways where people, but also representatives talk together. And the argument is, in a way, democracy can only be saved if they are kind of connected, if there is a sort of a systemic view, if they play together, then we can save democracy. But just setting in some way saying we have one mini public and then the world is a really better one, that's probably a complete illusion because too many people will be excluded and we cannot bet our, in a way, chances for democracy just on those very small kind of interventions. Thank you so much. Seraphine, do you want to add something on Andre's answer? No? Then we go on with Thorsten, please. Yeah, hello, Thorsten Stark from Mehrung Party in Germany. Um, uh, I wanted to stress uh, the importance of uh, implementation processes regarding uh, mini publics. We all know that uh, most mini publics uh, until now don't have such uh, implementation processes. No documentation of what follows uh, after um, the citizens' reports uh, uh, was formulated. Uh, so I think um, there would uh, be much more success. If we have uh, had regulations as in East Belgium or in the Austrian state of Vorarlberg, um, and uh, another uh, thing would, would be uh, media coverage, uh, which uh, influence does media coverage has have on uh, success of mini publics. Um, I know many mini, mini publics which had only a little media coverage or no media coverage at all, so no one. Uh, knew about them uh, and um, no pressure was set on politicians and administrations uh, in, in this way. Yeah, total agreement. Seraphine, you might want to also say something because we had originally, and that was also Mark Warren's big thing saying we need to track visibility. I mean, and that would be a sort of an additional variable for policy consequentiality. But maybe you can say more on this. That was 
just not possible. Yeah, right. We we run into reliability issues with this uh, variable, but we would have liked to inc include it, the visibility as well. I think it's a really good point. Thank you. Then we have one question in the chat yep. from Katy uh, Khan, and she asks. Mm -hmm. uh, so she's not an academic. Uh, she. Mm -hmm. Guys, and she uh, asked, um, how do you come to the conclusions that citizens do not want empowered many publics? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe that depends on the level of knowledge and understanding of many yeah. publics. So we could yeah. elaborate on that. Yeah, I'm very happy to do that. This is an article. I cannot say more on this. This is a uh, revised resubmit because, I mean, the first one we did in the British Journal, I mean, these are scenario experiments where you just get five or six repetitions of different setup of many publics and you always have to choose one saying which ones do you like better. So these are survey experiments set up to say it's like a knee jerk reaction that you say what sort of design features do you really like and which ones do you dislike and the first finding was well there in some way in general citizens don't like when they're empowered what they like if it's recommendations only or if that is coupled like an island with a direct democratic vote so in the follow-up study we said we also look at those who know something about many publics at least pretend that and who have participated in a mini public of course these are very few in representative surveys but in all these countries it was four percent who said that now here comes a very interesting result. They are more open to empowerment. But if you look then in a way, what do they like from the three options? Is it empowerment? Is it recommendation? Or is it recommendation with direct democratic voting? They are just indifferent. So what we say is in a way, if you there's no one who really says in some way only if it's empowered then in a way this is a sort of a legitimate mini public those who know it those who have participated they're just more open but at the end of the day they're indifferent how that happens and i i think this is a sort of a it's it's a very important result and it has much to do and this is maybe just to clarify one thing this has all to do with innovation research because you can say people like many publics and then they are very conservative imagine 10 years ago if you thought about electric cars you would also say great idea but how far does that vehicle drive me can I go on holiday with this? And then you have a lot of extra, pro you want a lot of extra provisions to make sure that you can really buy this car. And maybe it's a bit the same here with mini publics. So you could say, maybe it takes time, you like it, but now you would say many more things need to be clarified in order really to change a system from legacy institutions of the representative systems to lotocratic institutions. Thank you, Andre. Seraphine, do you want to add something? No? Okay. Um, it, it's nice to see that only in Stuttgart, I believe, can you make a comparison between a car and a mini public here. So it's quite <laughs> uh, see. Then we have another question from Michael. Um, um, I guess Joanna was first, so maybe she goes first because I spoke already. Oh, sorry, I didn't see because the hand is white with a white background. Sorry, uh, Joanna, please go ahead. It's fine, don't worry. I need to figure out a better system. Um, thank you so much for the presentation and the excellent research. Um, I'm sorry if I missed this in the presentation, but I wondered if you controlled for the variation in the recommendations. Um, obviously, there's a difference between kind of recommending that somebody gets or a group of people get a 10% salary versus more consideration should be given to the environment um, and I just wondered how or if you were able to control for that. Yeah, um, thank you for this question. This is a really good point because we thought a lot uh, about this as well and we didn't control for that but we, we tried to create different variable and code like different things regarding the recommendation but it was really really tough to have something reliable um, to to really use afterwards and it's also for this amount of cases is a bit unfortunate to um, go into depth is often not possible to find um, all this information 
and have a good scheme to yeah to control for that but i think um that's a really good point because every would have loved to include that and yeah i think therefore the 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 smaller studies like that look at a few cases or some or one case are really really also very uh helpful when they can go into this detail and um yeah compare these things better but yeah thank you <laughs> yes indeed and that is something i did in my phd and it took an awful <laughs> I'm just the wrong case so for 80 cases yeah. I could imagine how much time it would take uh, so uh, now we go on with uh, Michael's question and then we will have Jen thank you so I, I would go beyond the study that has been presented I, I was intrigued Andre and because that's something that really uh, concerns me about the different abilities of the liberators and that is a limiting condition um so I'm, I'm wondering you know whether this could be a call for for education you know civic education in the sense that the liberation training uh becomes a necessary condition of of your high school education mm -hmm. for example you know mm -hmm. so that's something that i think should be considered now uh, another question uh, and you know um uh, related to that is the question whether it's culture dependent you know mm -hmm. for example if you have certain countries i mean you were uh, pointing at Finland, you know, I mean, if you have certain cultures where you have a higher success rate, it might be interesting uh, to look into what the cultural factors are that could promote um, higher abilities with regard to deliberation. Now, another point, so it's not, I think it's not only the ability and skills that you can train. My question would be whether it's also a, qu uh, a question of disposition. Because, you know, there might be character trait, um, which are pretty much fixed. So you have a, you have a certain kind of people <laughs> who's, who you, you cannot convince them what, whatever you do, right? So the, the question would be whether, um, whether there could be more research about um, identifying personality traits. And then also, you know, what, what would that mean for the possibility of deliberation at all? If it's, the, let's say you have 20% of people you can never convince, what would that mean for the possibility of deliberative democracy? I mean, you could say that's kind of the, the death nail, you know, that's it. Um, yeah, so that these are my questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Brilliant questions. Very quick answers also in, in, in uh, uh, light of time. Um, I mean, there is a paper by Simon Niemeyer, where I'm also co-author, How Deliberation Happens, that the, the best ones who really started reasoning are those who get a sort of an attentive listening treatment in advance. So in a way, that's not in a way, in a way, education, but in a way they were just like they had a personal trainer in a way, putting them in a in a kind of a better mode to get a better listening. And that seems to really have a splash effect on these things. The other things I like, the traits questions the problem is often this was not included in standard surveys so we cannot look at that but it's a it's a serious possibility nonetheless and we found that also in the, in the pan-european poll deliberative poll europolis where we really did this kind of nitty-gritty uh, analysis of um, the kind of what people said, how they reacted to each other. They were sort of, we have really wondered, is it cultural bias? So you could show that people from working class, from Southern and um, and Eastern Europe, they just had different ways of expressing things. In, in And you can also say there is working class kind of codes, how they present things. And I still remember there was one guy from Glasgow, which we couldn't code because he only said something once, no one got it. And then in a way people said, oh no, no, we all understand English, so we don't need the simultaneous translation. Please tell it again. He said it again, no one got it. And then he stopped talking. And someone uh, from Glasgow once said this was Glaswegian a, a kind of accent. It was it was coded language. No one got it. He clearly said something very unpleasant but that's how you also lose your voice. And I think that's really interesting. And I do think you need sort of sort of enclaves before or within these many topics in order to really make people that their voices get heard or that there are cultural translators who really help to say, okay, that is the sort of message. And I try to, let's say, translate it to the others. 
Thank you, André. So, no, Jen, uh, nice to see you. You have the floor, the question. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, thanks, André. That was super interesting. There mightn't be enough time, so if you do have any working paper or anything, be really interested mm -hmm. in, in seeing it. But um, if I remember the slide from the multi-level logistic um, model, there were just two things that mattered, right? Um, which were just uh, supported key actors, and that was just mm -hmm. just about significant. And the other was authorization, which was mm -hmm. maybe a little bit more, and everything else was insignificant. So I was just wondering, is that if I recall that correctly, and then can you tell me how you coded for those two things? Like, what exactly is the difference between, like, is authorization that it's come from the top down? In which case, it's, is it a bit endogenous to support from key actors because it's top down? Like, so how how does this uh, how does this coding work? Yeah, I, I think I will shortly answer this. Thank you, Jane. Um, we also had uh, um. This what you were referring to is a top down or bottom up. This was called our organization. I'm not sure if, if we um, have the perfect word for this, but we called who initiated it organization. And this was only marginally um, significant because we also don't have so many cases. And this was slightly um, negative. So bottom up, like we expected uh, a bit less chance of um, policy changes. Then we found also um, um, marginally significant that the, that the level matters, that if it's a regional case, it's more likely to be taken up um, or successful in a sense of policy change than national or European ones. And also we found a significant effect for the timing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if I answered all your questions. Um, if you want to know more about the coding, yeah. Just go ahead and also I can obviously send you um, the, the paper if you're interested that we're working on. Yeah, yeah. And I think Seraphine was very modest. We could have just, she could have put in more, more stars that it would be look much more significant. So if it's really on the left or right hand side, it's really in a way, in, 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 in a way, a very high kind of confidence level. Thank you. So there are not, uh, all the questions. So maybe I will make use of my privileged position and ask a, a question to Serafine and then André. So um, uh, I was wondering, so so you have studied the uptake of many publics, but the question of the legitimacy of the uptake has not been raised in the presentation. And so I, I was wondering if you could maybe uh, reflect a bit on that, uh, because if we have an uptake that aligns with the preferences of decision makers, is that a good thing? Is that a good thing under certain conditions? What would then be these conditions? So maybe if you could just reflect a bit on the legitimacy of an uptake, when is it legitimate or not? Who wants to go ahead. <laughs> That's very, very difficult questions you ask. Uh, <laughs> Sure, I think I remember also part of your PhD where you thought of, of this, this uh, topic. And I think um, uh, like there are several ways to, to view this, what would be legitimate and what not, because ultimately we, we cannot know. Um, it depends on your idea of uh, what kind of democracy you want uh, or find legitimate would be my answer. So there are very various way to, ways to think of it. For me, I'm not um, automatically saying it's it's legitimate or not. Yeah, I I might add in a way you could say if political elites have already decided and just want to have another yes on their decision, I think then you can really question why you do it. Right, that would be really organized top down, a pre a, in some way only. Um, a policy appraisal and only if it's completely in alignment with their preferences i think then you can really ask what is the real extra value of such citizen forums but what we or, or seraphine found in a way it's still a mixed picture so there was policy development and there was sort of kind of partial uptake so in one way you could say it's somewhere in between so but it's a it's a great question, and I think we probably also need to think these things through. So it was more a sort of an empirical way of looking at things, and then the big questions follow. 
Yeah, thank you. And I really, it wasn't my intention to throw you under the bus uh, we, and, and including the, the, the workshop it's because I thought about it and never found the answer. That's why I, I wanted to ask you the question as well. So uh, this concludes uh, this seminar. Thank you, André and Seraphine, for the very nice presentation. Thank you, everyone in the audience. It was a nice turnout. Um, and I wish you the very best for the end of your day, wherever you are. It was a pleasure. And we are looking forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much. And, and, thank and you just very much. Uh, quickly, on behalf of the entire Participedia community, thank you all for actively listening and participating in today's generative <laughs> seminar series, Provocations by Seraphine Arnold and Andre Bettiger uh, from the University of Stuttgart. <laughs> A uh, big thank you to our speakers for all of their creative energies and labors in taking the, sh the time to share and be with us today. We are incredibly uh, grateful. We encourage you all to continue these conversations, provocations, and questionings. Let's keep working together to build and understand more equitable, responsive, accountable, and democratic governance systems. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>